Well, good day, everybody. This is Chris with the Ancient Scholar. I hope you're uh, all doing well today. Uh, apologize, all apologies for the uh, delay of a, over, over a month, maybe two months uh, between videos. It was a really busy summer, and I ended up having to spend most of the summer in the hospital working with uh, students <coughs> um, due to having a couple of uh, classes occurring. Um, congruently and uh, the there is a big need for clinical instructors so I ended up spending most of the summer in the hospital uh, and it was a pretty significant commute uh, to the particular hospital I was at um, but it was nice I was uh, able to take my mountain bike and as soon as we got done um, I'd hit the trail and then I'd be home um, after dark and I wasn't particularly um, in any sort of mood to do uh, uh, videos. Uh, and then more recently, I've had some um, medical emergencies ha occur uh, in my family, and I've had to uh, go out of state um, to uh, see um, some close family members that uh, are suffering from some pretty severe medical problems. So I took a little time off. Um, more recently to uh, deal with some of those those issues but I'd like to in this particular video I'd like to kind of finish up the whole Venom series and um, there will probably be some revisions that I'll need to do so people have uh, asked some questions about um, uh, about some of the snakes uh, there was a specific question about the Pacific um, and uh, the, the poster, the, the, the YouTube user asked a question, you know who you are, um, and I would say you, you have probably have a much better idea of how snakes are identified than I do, um, and so my, my suspicion is you're probably correct, um, you're likely correct, and I need to go back and uh, uh, revise that a little bit and uh, talk about the different subtypes and the locations are probably you're probably correct on the locations as well um, so I would I definitely concede that I'm probably wrong in whatever I said there um, okay so what I want to do now is just kind of finish up on uh, talk about managing uh, North American pit viper envenomations in the United States um, there's really only one uh, quote-unquote anecdotal agent uh, currently available, and that is the um, CROFAB. That's a crotalid polyvalent uh, immune fab. Um, basically, what you do is you take uh, in a real condensed, uh, real high-yield way of looking at it is you expose animals to um, venom. The animals create antibodies, and then you get those antibodies, you extract those antibodies from the uh, plasma of the animal, and you, um, you do some minor modifications to the antibodies, and then you um, concentrate those antibodies, and lo and behold, you have this antivenom. So you, when you administer it, these are antibody fragments. They attach to the, the venom and they uh, allow the body to deactivate uh, the venom. And that's a real high-yield way of looking at how a lot of these anti-venoms, these, these uh, fab, these immune fab uh, antivenoms work. And, and polyvalent just means that what they do is they take several species of snake venom. <clears throat> okay, the most common and, of course, uh, you know, like the Mojave is, is, is one of them, one of the four uh, snakes. I believe the Sidewinder is another one. But anyway, they take four different types of venom, um, and they expose the animals that type of venom, and then they create all these different antibodies. And so in, in um, hypothetically speaking, the anti-venom, the, the crofab, should um, be able to quote-unquote neutralize um, a whole uh, range of um, uh, crotalid envenomations, but as 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 we know, certain snakes have uh, venoms that are more uh, proteolytic. Other snakes have venoms that are um, more neurotoxic, and so if 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 you've been bitten or envenomated by a snake that um, 
has a type of venom that isn't well covered by the crow fab, it's going to be much more difficult um, to treat that particular patient, particularly if it's a, a significant envenomation. Now, not all snake bites are, are uh, result in envenomation. There, there are what we so-called dry bites of the snake. Uh, and, I, you know, the evidence is all over the place, but I'd say somewhere around, you know, maybe 5 to 15% of your snake bites are going to be dry or, you know, there won't be any bite at all. Um, so let's just talk about how we, in general, how, how do we assess and manage these patients. So the first thing you want to do is, obviously, you want to make sure it's safe for you to take care of this patient. You don't want to be dealing with a snake. Um, <clears throat> and um, you want to go ahead and make sure the patient has a, an open airway, they're breathing, they have an intact circulatory status, all that we call the ABCs, all, all that good stuff, right? And then what you're going to do is you're going to look at where they are bitten, and you're going to look for local signs and symptoms of, of a bite. Um, the first thing that you generally see is uh, local indications of inflammation, redness, swelling, pain. Okay, these are more localized symptoms. Okay, just because you see maybe what appears to be fang marks and maybe some pain doesn't necessarily mean that there is an envenomation or significant envenomation, and we'll talk about more signs and symptoms we can look for. Okay, so um, what are we going to do? Well, you're going to mobilize the extremity if they're bitten in an extremity, which most people tend to be bitten in either their hands or, or their, their legs, so most bites are extremities. You're going to mobilize it. Um, I don't recommend applying a tourniquet to stop the flow of, of, of lymphatics. Um, there's a lot of discussion there. I just leave that alone. Just to mobilize it prevent it from being moved around, uh, start an IV, get the patient on a cardiac monitor, draw labs um, if you're in a situation where you can do that. And you, there are some specific labs that you're going to want to draw as well as um, your typical uh, chemistry, your, your SMA12 or your, your CMP and your CBC. Um, you're going to want to do a comprehensive coagula coagulation profile, PT, PTT, um, th those kinds of things, you're also going to probably uh, want to monitor their CK, their CKMB, their myoglobin. If they're having you know, chest pain, dyspnea, it may be worth it to draw um, cardiac enzymes and do a 12 lead and, uh, uh, because you, you're placing the body in stress and there can be some uh, ischemia that can, result as, as, that can occur as a result of that. Um, so yeah, um, you're probably you're definitely going to want to uh, monitor the fibrinogen, and then of course your platelets uh, for thrombocytopenia. But your platelets tend to be uh, part of your CBC, so you pick those up. Okay, so um, you do that. Um, see if make sure they're up to date on their tetanus vaccine, and then call poison control. Okay, give poison control a call. They, they can help you out with more specific or more nuanced information. The number I have this memorized is 1-800-222-2, uh, 1-800-32s, a 1 and another 32. So 1-800-222-1222. All right, so there you go. That's your kind of your initial thing. And then your, your, your secondary assessment, you're really going to look for uh, signs of significant envenomation. Okay, is there significant? Is there swelling? Is it tender? Is it red? Is there ecchymosis? Um, do you see like blisters or, or or blebs or bloody blebs beginning to develop? Okay, um, look at the labs. Okay, are your coagulation uh, is your coagulation profile becoming um, elevated? Um, specifically, the PT or your pro time is it going up? Is your fibrinogen going down? Are you developing a thrombocytopenia? Are your platelets going down? Okay, and then are there any kind of uh, systemic uh, indications of systemic involvement? Okay, is is your patient having uh, signs of like DIC? You know, they're bleeding from their eyes and their ears, from their IV puncture sites, etc. Um, are they just having signs and symptoms of significant neurotoxicity, dyspnea? Um, they're having fasciculations, muscle muscle twitching and fasciculations. Um, are they vomiting and they you can't get that under control? Um, 
Are their hemodynamics altered, specifically the blood pressure becoming hypotensive, okay? If you have any of this stuff going on, um, this, is, this indicates that uh, there, there's probably significant envenomation, okay? Um, another thing that you want to do is if you have some redness or whatever around the, where they are bit, mark that. And then every 15 minutes or so, reassess and then mark that and then just write a time. And that allows people who are assessing that patient to see how quickly the, um, the cutaneous symptoms or the cutaneous signs um, are, are progressing. Okay, is it, is, it, is it getting worse quickly? Is it getting better? That kind of thing. Okay, um, now if you don't have any of that stuff going on, okay, or, ve or very, very mild, um, then just observe the patient. Okay, and uh, if, if you don't have any indications whatsoever that they're envenomated, so it looks like a dry bite, your labs are fine, they're not having significant pain, there's no redness really, it just looks like a little puncture. Um, if there are no signs and symptoms whatsoever, um, you can discharge them and you know, you know, hold them for eight or, eight or 10 hours and they can be discharged. Now, if your facility has a protocol that you have to follow, please do that. I'm, you know, I'm not giving medical advice per se. The, these are just kind of general guidelines I'm throwing out there, okay? So don't take what I'm saying um, literally, okay? Um, I believe CROFAB has some nice posters and uh, information on their website uh, as far as a uh, protocol that you can f uh, follow. Um, but, you know, 8 to 10 hours, you can discharge them. Um, get an initial set of labs and at least an, another set um, just prior to discharge to, sh to show uh, quantitatively that nothing's going on. All right, and then of course you need good education um, when you send them home uh, for them to return. Okay, so you're going to have to do good teaching and you're probably going to want to arrange for follow up in 24 to 48 hours to make sure they're doing okay. Poison control follow up as well. Okay, now if they do have uh, any significant signs and symptoms, you're going to want to start with CROFAB. Okay, so they need an IV, obviously. Your initial dose in a typical adult patient is going to be about four to six vials. Okay, if you think they need CROFAB, you want to start mixing this stuff early. It takes a little while to mix it. And, if you, and when you reconstitute it, you can't just inject okay, the, the sterile water into the vial and mix it up really good. Like maybe uh, if, if you're treating this like a, you're mixing a gram of ceftriaxone or something, you mix it up really, really easily. And uh, you, you can't do that because it'll foam up and then it takes forever for the foam to go down. So it's actually really slow. So you're going to want to get multiple people in and have multiple people, four, five, six people, mixing slowly at the same time so you can uh, make good use. You don't want just one person drawing up the vials individually um, because it's going to take forever to get that CROFAB mix. So get lots of people on that, okay? Lots of people mixing that CROFAB. Four to six vials, um, I would just go six, okay? Just hit them with six right off the bat. Um, it's just a good, easy number for me to memorize. Uh, you can mix it in 250 mils of saline, get, and then go ahead and give it over an hour. Okay, so that's your your first dose. Uh, that should be started as soon as possible. Probably going to happen in the emergency room. All right. If you don't have CROFAB and they have significant envenomation, they need to be transferred post haste to a facility that can administer CROFAB. Okay. And then what are you going to do? Well, you're going to monitor them. Um, and if they look like they're getting worse or they're not improving, okay, they don't clinically stabilize, you're going to want to give another dose after an hour or so. All right. Um, and you kind of can repeat this cycle. Okay. Ad infinitum if, if need be. At, at some point, they're either hopefully will prove or, you know, you'll have significant morbidity mortality. Um, at some point, if that patient's not improving or getting worse, at some point, if that patient remains refractory and you have given, you know, one, two, three doses, you're going to have to make a decision to call. You need to get an expert in, okay? And, and poison control may be able to help you out with this, but you need to have some expert consultation or you may need to transfer that patient to a facility that has um, an expert in envenomation. 
because um, these patients can very easily develop DIC. They can very easily develop rhabdomyolysis and renal failure and a whole myriad of complications, uh, cardiovascular complications, life-threatening dysrhythmias, um, uh, hepatic impairment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I would say if the patient remains refractory after the first dose, okay, so you give your first dose an hour or so later, um, hour, you know, after an hour, that patient's getting worse or they're not improving at all, at that point, that's probably a good point to get some sort of expert. Um, if at any point your patient develops shock-like signs and symptoms, okay, they have any airway, any, any compromise to their airway, breathing, or circulation, okay, um, or they have bites to very, um, very critical areas, the neck, the head, the face, um, those kinds of things, or the patient develops an allergic or, or possibly an anaphylactic or anaphylactoid reaction at any point in time, um, you're probably going to want to uh, get some expert consultation, possibly even transfer that patient. Uh, okay, uh, so let's say that you, you've gone through that um, and it, you need to be monitoring the patient very frequent, frequently and um, at some point, you know, if you've given the first or second dose and they seem to stabilize out, you get them a bed in the ICU. This is not a patient that should be going to a general floor. They need to be in ICU. They need to have serial labs uh, drawn. They need um, intensive monitoring, probably should be on a cardiac monitor. Um, uh, continuous cardiac telemetry as well. Maybe even worth getting serial 12 leads on them. I don't know what the evidence shows there, but maybe worth it. Um, and you're probably going to look at maintenance crofab therapy. So maintenance therapy, once you get them under control, in general you can do about two vials every six hours or so. Um, and you do that uh, for three Okay, so two vials, Q6 hours times three. Um, so you're looking at um, 18, basically 18 to 24 hours after you've stabilized that patient, you're going to be giving them this maintenance crofab therapy. Okay, um, and then after you know about 24 hours or so, if they remain stable and their symptom, their signs and symptoms are resolving, they're looking good, their labs have improved everything's looking good, you can go ahead and consider um, uh, discharge at that point in time, but uh, obviously they're going to need good follow-up, you're going to need a good discharge planning and all that, and that's, you know, nothing I'm going to talk about in any detail here. Uh, other treatments that may be helpful um, if you're con concerned about infection, um, or they look like they may be developing infection, you may want to get a wound culture, get a culture insensitivity, um, possibly consider antibiotics if you know if you're you're worried. You maybe even consider prophylactic prophylactic antibiotics. Start them on a broad spectrum. I don't know, like a third gen cephalosporin, uh, ceftriaxone, and then if if need be, when the, the culture and sensitivity comes back, you can you can change to a more narrow narrow spectrum. I'll leave that to you know the clinicians that make those particular decisions. Um, Blood products, okay, if your patient develops thrombocytopenia, um, you know, you may need to give them platelets, you, know, you may need to transfuse them, they meet clotting factors, uh, at fresh frozen plasma, those kinds of things. Again, that'll, that'll really be determined, that'll depend on, you know, what are their labs, what are their bleeding time, their coagulation profiles look like, um, and how are they doing just generally uh, clinically. Uh, pain, opioids can be helpful with pain. Um, NSAIDs may be helpful as well. Um, if they have renal dysfunction, NSAIDs probably should be avoided since. Yeah. Uh, there's some other things like shock therapy. I don't know what the efficacy of, of electroshock therapy is. Um, I would say it's probably not a general thing that you would do um, a lot. Again, I really haven't seen the evidence. Um, tourniquets, I haven't really seen good evidence there. And, there is perhaps some evidence that suggests that the tour tourniquets may be more harmful. Uh, steroids, I don't know that steroids are necessarily indicated. Um, perhaps if there is a, obviously if you suspect an, a, a, an allergic uh, reaction, steroids and then um, antihistamines uh, such as diphenhydramine or dimenhydramate or something like that. Um, 
uh, would definitely be indicated in that particular um, uh, instance. And ana uh, or allergic reactions are not uncommon with Crofab, even mild ones, so uh, be on the lookout for that. Um, and I, I think, you know, I really think that's kind of the big picture, and I was able to kind of blow through that in about 20 minutes, but I, I think that's a pretty good overview of managing, and I, I think it was pretty holistic as well, looking at the big picture from start to finish. Uh, and um, I think I talked about the major, the major things. I'm not really going to talk about these more nuanced treatments like electroshock therapy and applying tourniquets simply because I don't really see good evidence for those things and you know the, the way that I do medicine and I am not a practitioner okay I, I am a, I'm a nurse and a paramedic um, but I'm not an autonomous practitioner okay like a physician or a, or a mid-level provider like a PA or an NP or something like that um, so I'm not out there making autonomous fully autonomous decisions um, but I tend to be perhaps a bit more conservative when it comes to these more novel therapies, uh, particularly if there isn't like a huge base of evidence supporting them. Now, in the next couple of years, as Anavip perhaps hits the market, which is kind of what started this whole playlist back at the you know back in what March or April or whenever I started these videos. Um, there, Anavip, obviously, there's probably going to be a nuance to that dosing regime, and you know, I may have to uh, come back and do a video talking about Anavip um, in a little more detail. But at this point, with Crofab, um, this I think I think is a pretty good uh, overview. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, cut it off here. And as always, thanks for hanging in there.